नमस्ते स्वामी जी नमस्ते रिगार्डिंग दक्रास इन द रीसेंट डेज वी कैन फाइंड दैट आफ्टर दैंडमिक many people have started speaking about chakras there are many tutors who claim that they can activate the chakras within two days or seven days or something like that but how mantras and chakras are associated especially the mantras associated with adi shakti how they are able to actually purify and activate these wheels of energy okay that's the question we're going to start with but of course that leads to other questions <laughs> uh okay the mantras for the seven chakras are given in the dharma sar video guide publication which i'll put a link in the video description um but i mean there's a link in many many videos everybody should download that because it describes the whole channel the channel is structured according to the chakra system and the four levels of consciousness okay so for each chakra each chakra has several petals and each petal has a bija a seed syllable and the chakra itself has a seed syllable the whole chakra so by chanting these bijams these are not ordinary mantras they're like kling kong kring ein like that and these invoke certain energies which we discussed in detail in our work on the matrika tantra matrika is the meanings of the 51 sanskrit letters and their role in the process of creation so what we're doing when we're chanting these mantras and activating the chakras cleansing the chakras is a better term i think because chakras are already active where you'd be dead <laughs> but cleansing the chakras is the role of sadhana sadhana is to remove the upadis or the coverings of uh, the real self and the only reason why we're actually uh in ignorance why we don't realize brahman immediately is because it's covered brahman is always there huh that's who we really are actually and that's how we exist but because these coverings come there a kind of ignorance that stops us from seeing the way it really is so all right uh, chanting these seed mantras bijams bija means seed um gradually removes these coverings these upadis and the uh, upadis when they are removed then the kundalini can rise now it's her nature to rise it's not that we have to do anything to get her to rise because she's always uh wanting to unite with shiva in sahasrar she's in muladhar at the base of the spine coiled up like a snake three and a half times and when we uh, remove these upadis when we 
especially when we uh, let go of the identification represented by the three grantis, the knots. And we also discussed this in detail in earlier videos. The three grantis, the Brahma granti, the Vishnu granti, and the Rudra granti, knots. She can penetrate these knots very easily as long as we remove all the upadis. But what happens a lot in Kundalini yoga is that people will try to force her. To, that's not within our scope of will. It's not possible. And plus, she doesn't like it. <laughs> and we always get some reaction if we try to push her or pull her or you know make her do anything. She is the boss. She is nature itself. She is life and even consciousness. So we can't, I mean, she's so much more powerful. Look at these new, did you see the photos from the web uh, telescope? Yes. She is all Jim's of that. Right. Shakti, yes. Shakti, unlimited power. So there's no question of forcing her. <laughs> uh, what we have to do is simply get out of her way. So we should have the view, not that I am chanting this mantra so that Kundalini will arise. That is wrong view. Correct view is, I am chanting these mantras to cleanse the upadis from the chakras and get out of the way so that she can naturally arise. And when that happens, oh boy, <laughs> that's self-realization. That's enlightenment. Yeah. That's awakening. Huh? All of that good stuff. So once this thing is done, as you said, that we should not force her, force the energy to rise. And so the, nowadays we get advertisements saying that we will force it and within a few days it will rise and everything. Nonsense. So how far the bhakti yoga movement like uh, that of the various uh, Krishna, this thing, the Krishna movements, how they are moving or the, they, uh, the way they say it, that Nama Sankirtan, chanting Hari, 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 how that thing can help the energy to build up. Actually, they don't say that. Okay. They say that if you chant Hari Hari or Radhe Radhe or, you know, any of those bhakti mantras, that, uh, that a god or a goddess will bless you. And it's true. It's true. Worshipping Vishnu leads to happiness. Because Vishnu is the avatar of the sattva guna, mode of goodness. So worshiping Vishnu automatically leads to happiness. I, I listen to Vishnu Sahasranam. I chant Vishnu Sahasranam every day. Part of my regular sadhana routine. And I experience uh, so much good things and protection and so many things. Now, the, the, the illusion that the bhaktas are in is that they try to do this under scriptural rules and regulations. And they call this Vaidhi Bhakti. Vaidhi means instructions, like rules. But that's not really Bhakti. That's actually Karma Yoga. So I think I need to back up and talk about the distinctions among the chakras and the different types of yogas. Now, if you've been on this channel more than five minutes, you've seen the fourfold matrix of consciousness. Okay. And how it relates 
uh, to the seven chakras. I'll put it up here just for a second. Uh, it's very familiar to anyone who's been hanging around. <laughs> the first three chakras, sex, energy, and movement, are part of the uh, human being that is like an animal. Like when you go to sleep at night, what happens? Digestion is going on, breathing is going on, uh, some uh, like recalibration of the nervous system and endocrine system uh, is going on during sleep. How is this happening? By Shakti. She is the life. And so even if we are asleep, we still breathe, we still digest our food, and so many other things. This is the animal. And uh, all this is below uh, the Granta, uh, Brahma Granti. And all this is part of Karma Yoga. Now, karma Yoga is uh, under dualistic consciousness, Dvaita Vada, the dualistic view where I am an individual being separate from everybody else and I am a doer and I am responsible for the consequences of my actions and so on and so on. So in that mood, we have to follow scriptural rules and regulations. That's given in Shastra, it's very clear. But when these chakras become a certain amount of uh, purified, and the Brahma Granti begins to dissolve, then the heart chakra begins to open. And when that happens, bhakti arises spontaneously. Okay? So, because love has to be spontaneous. Huh? I was talking with my friend yesterday. He has a very beautiful wife, charming, attractive, very powerful lady. And I said to him, well, what would happen if you tried to force her to love you? <laughs> and he said, oh, that would be a huge fight, a big fight. <laughs> so it's the same thing with God or goddess. Whoever your Ishta Devata is, you cannot force the love of God. It has to arise spontaneously. It's a gift, a blessing. It's not within our control, not within our power to decide to love somebody. What a ridiculous idea. So in the same way, uh, simply performing Vaidhi Bhakti according to scriptural rules is not going to give rise to Bhakti. Actual bhakti is spontaneous, and it comes when the chakras are sufficiently purified. So that love arises because of uh, contemplating the good qualities of the beloved. For example, my, my Ishta Devata is, well, Narasimha and Kamakshi, Goddess Kamakshi. Uh, so when I chant Lalita Sahasranama, and it tells so many good qualities of hers, I just feel so much love. She's my mother. Huh? She's all of our mothers. So when I think about her power, her opulence, her intelligence, her goodwill, her compassion, and so on, then automatically, love comes. Just like when you think of your birth mother, huh? how beautiful she is, how nice, you know, how many wonderful things she's done for you, and so on and so on. You automatically love. So in the same way, love of God arises spontaneously when the chakras are cleansed, at least up to the heart chakra. And of course, by chanting mantras, the the throat chakra is also purified. And this can lead to uh, transcending the Vishnu Granti. 
just like Brahma Granti is attachment to the animal, to the body. Vishnu Granti is attachment to a certain mood, a certain emotion. And so by transcending that attachment, then uh, the Agnya Chakra can open up. And what happens then? Meditation arises spontaneously. Not like you have to sit and grind and force the mind to concentrate. And, uh, that's horrible. Whenever I see anybody doing that, I tell them, look, it's better you don't meditate. You better just do sadhana. But when the mind is attracted by the beauty of God or goddess, meditation, concentration, withdrawal, pratyakshara, huh? withdrawal of the attention from the senses, all these things happen spontaneously. Now, you, you have almost learned all the scriptures or most of the scriptures from, uh, you have learned all the Vedas, as well as you have learned the Upanishads, because in your many of your videos that you have made, you have stated regarding all these things. <clears throat> also, it is being said, that is what I have heard, that in the womb, the fetus, knows his purpose of existence or why he is coming into existence, why he is manifesting as a human being, what would be his responsibilities over here. But the moment he comes in this world, he gets enveloped by Maya and then he starts forgetting the original purpose and goes deep into Maya, and hence many of them get difficulty in realizing God or realizing self. All of this. But is this mantra from Bhagavat? Om Satyavratam Satyaparam Trisatyam Satyasya Yonin Nihitam Cha Satye Satyasya Satyam Rata Satyanetram Sharanam Prapanna. Is this or will this mantra help in realizing the truth? Because it is all Satya, Satya and Satya. All mantras are good. Huh? Uh, the mantra that is best for you is uh, related to your Ishta Devata. Okay, like if I was to start chanting uh, Ganapati mantra, nothing would happen. It would, it would just be a formality. It's not real. It's not from the heart. So mantras have to be chosen very carefully with a lot of knowledge, a lot of background. That what is my Ishta Devata? What is my Stai Bhava? my eternal relationship, the mood, the rasa. Five rasas, neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. Okay, so these five rasas, one of these will be your primary relationship. And then the other rasas will, uh, show up in relationships with various other forms of God. So when you realize these relationships, then the mantra comes out automatically because the mantra has to be chanted in the right mood. It's not, you know, it's not just a formality. That's Vaidhi Bhakti. That's new, actually neutrality, rasa of neutrality rules and regs. <laughs> but when you reach spontaneous bhakti, then the mantra automatically comes that is right for you. See, and then you experience tremendous bhava, tremendous spiritual emotions and bliss. 
but mantra can only take you so far. It can only take you up to Rudra Granti. And a meditation is there to cleanse the Agna Chakra and uh, then break through the Rudra Granti, which is attachment to name and form. See, how can you have mantra? <laughs> unless you have attachment to name and form, the form of the deva or devi and the name, which is part of the mantra. So this is a big subject, but basically we, um, we want to clear out all these upadis and it requires guidance of a realized soul. Uh, because a realized guru can see all these things as if he's you. Because the realized person is simply reflecting whatever Chaita guru is telling you in the heart. We all have guru within, Chaita guru. And external guru is simply the reflection, the friend who guides you on the path. But once you reach a certain point, you don't even need that. You can be completely internally guided like that. So the sadhana lasts as long as there's any impurity, any upadi, any blockage, any attachment. You know, all these things have to be overcome. And in the final stage of meditation, we realize nirvana, emptiness. And this is the ultimate refuge. This is the um, space beyond all name and form. And in that space, then Brahman reveals itself. Okay. Attaining the Brahman is the only goal of the life or there are other goals as well which are the purpose of this existence? Well, you know, the four Purusharthas. Okay. Artha, Kama, Moksha. Uh, Artha, sorry, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Right. And these correspond to the four stages of life. In Brahmachari or student life, when uh, learns the dharma, the shastras. In married life, grihastha, then one accumulates material possessions and wealth. In vanaprastha, then one is free to enjoy. And finally, in sannyas, that's for moksha, final release. All these things have to be completed. For example, if you don't complete Artha, economic development, how can you retire? How can you be free from you know, economic and domestic responsibilities unless you take sannyas? See, how can you uh, leave the material world until you have enjoyed it completely? There will be some unresolved tensions in the mind and that will stop your meditation. So, you know, this is why we teach Tantra because we're not artificially trying to stop the senses and activities that are required for ordinary life. There's a great misunderstanding that all sadhana has to be in sattvic mode. And that's only true for the Vaishnavas because they're worshiping Vishnu who is the sattvic. But for tantrikas, we can use any mode. Okay, this is why tantrikas practice uh, sex. That desire has to be fully experienced or one becomes frustrated and, well, what does Krishna say? From contemplating the objects of the senses, lust arises. From lust, anger arises. 
because lust is never satisfied, really. From anger, delusion arises, and from delusion, one falls down into material consciousness. So uh, we recommend that you experience life in its fullness. You get everything done, you know? Like, I'm very fortunate I had my own business. I was able to retire. Now I'm on pension. I have no worries about economics. But we see some sannyasis are begging or raising funds in other ways. Um, so anyway, uh, we don't want to make a business out of spiritual life. We want all business finished. Then we take up spiritual life. You know, that's why I never charge anything. That's why I never, you know, I distribute all the knowledge freely. It was given to me freely. Wow, should I turn it into capital and try to make business? <laughs> <laughs> Not my nature. So uh, we're running out of time. I hope you got the um, answers to yes. your questions that you need. Uh, it didn't come out as good as we tried yesterday, but then we lost the recording. <laughs> yeah. But so, yes, in fact, there are many things which are new uh, that you explained today, especially related to the bhakti and how one needs to behave in that bhakti, being in the family life and doing bhakti and trying to attain Brahman which is really a very good explanation. Thank that, you. Uh, and yes, thank you very much for mm. guiding through this thing. It was indeed a very joyous moment to listen to all these things. It's my pleasure, Kostu. Sure. <laughs> so any question you have, you can always ping me on signal Yes. Okay. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Sri Krishna Arpanastu.